Coming up next on Conversations, social justice advocate Julia Bowles. She gave up a legal career to seek a new path in Africa and Afghanistan. And it was really the poorest of the poor who taught me I was looking for success in the wrong place. How she worked to build schools and change the lives of Afghan girls who were often forbidden from getting an education. We went from 420 girls at that school to over a thousand. And after 10 fulfilling but stressful years in that war ravaged country. My friends have been shot, killed, kidnapped, beheaded. She's focusing on a new global education mission to help young women around the world. The most radical, comprehensive way to change a community is through educating girls in particular. Julia Bowles, next on Conversations. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you. Julia Bowles, welcome to Conversations. Good to have you here. And, and congratulations on uh, being the recipient of the Seattle World Affairs Council uh, Global Citizen of the Year Award. That's uh, quite a great honor. I was there actually that night. Uh, Jimmy Carter also was the keynote speaker, but I imagine for you that was something that was uh, very precious to have that night. Well, thank you for having me here today. I'm thrilled to be here, and I felt so honored to be the recipient of this award. But more excitingly for me was to have Jimmy Carter be one of the presenters. And for those of us who are involved in social justice work, he has been one of our heroes, one of my heroes for years. So it was really a thrill for me. Yeah, for, at 87 years old and for the amount of traveling that he and his wife still do and everything that they still do, pretty amazing, very impressive. But what you do is impressive as well. Let's talk about uh, Julio Bowles and really how you earned that honor because it's your work that you have done globally that has made so much uh, difference in young women's lives and young people's lives. Um, you actually were an attorney here doing international law work. I was. If you had uh, met me back in 1998, I was a partner at Ryan Swanson in Cleveland here in Seattle. I was practicing international law. And uh, just about that time, one of my sisters had ovarian cancer. And I found that her touch with this illness really got me questioning who I am, what am I doing, uh, what's the legacy I want to leave behind. And in looking back at this Julie I had spent years creating, I actually didn't like her. Hmm. So I ended up by uh, taking a leap of faith, and I did something that was on my heart, which was social justice for women and girls, and I ended up by moving to Zimbabwe in Africa. And how did you end up going there, and what did you do? Well, Zimbabwe at that time was really a, one of the stars of Africa. A lot of the large NGOs, non-governmental organizations in the world were based there. And so I just started doing a whole variety of things to get introduced to human rights and uh, social justice work, all sorts of development tools. But one of the things that really happened to me while I was there is a, a kind of a life-changing experience. I have to say that I had defined success in the past as good grades, a good salary, a uh, good job title, and that was part of this Julie that I didn't like anymore. Mm. And when I got to Africa, I lived in townships where people were in tin sheds and cardboard boxes, uh, mud houses where there was no running water or electricity, and it was really the poorest of the poor who taught me I was looking for success in the wrong place. It wasn't what I had valued, but it was really about giving back to people and about the relationships that I had built. Kind of sounds like you were out to find yourself, and maybe you I did. was. I was. This was kind of like my eat, pray, love uh, <laughs> journey. Uh, but it was a wonderful experience for me. I ended up by resigning from my partnership, mm -hmm. and I made really a decision to um, help people as much as I could. And it took me to about 70 countries around the world, eventually ending up in Afghanistan. So after 9-11, uh, it came to light that this country had been ruled by this group of extremists called the Taliban. The Taliban had a list of virtues and vices. 
It was a virtue girls couldn't go to school, a virtue women can't work, a virtue women can't go outside unless they have a burqa that covers them from head to foot, a virtue that windows are blackened so women can't look out and men can't look in. It was a horrible situation. And on top of that, you then have this extreme poverty. And Afghanistan led the world in child mortality, maternal mortality, landmine victims, and um, literacy was about 6.5% in the area that I ended up working in. I hooked up with teams that were living in Central Asia. They had lived there for 15 years, they had relationships, they spoke the language, they were living in the local communities. And so where other folks struggled when they first got in, the teams that I worked with were already into those communities making differences, and they gave me a big sense of uh, security as well. Tell me about Parvana. Oh, well, Parvana is this little girl that I met. And actually, I have to step back a second because I went back to Afghanistan about 16 times. And one of the reasons I kept going back is because the results we saw were not simply good. They were phenomenal. And I really saw that education made a difference in every aspect of life, socially, politically, economically. And one of the things we also saw is that it gave communities hope. And, um, and Parvana is an example of that. So you have to imagine in our schools, uh, when we have a dedication, it's one of the biggest events in a community. Thousands of people come, they're singing, dancing, a feast. But at the very first school that we built, there were also hundreds of girls who didn't come because their fathers didn't believe that the girls should be educated. And Parvana was one of those little girls. She was about nine years old, and uh, she had never been to school before, and she stayed home day after day weaving carpets. Well, one day, Parvana shows up at school, to much of everyone's surprise. And I remember the principal, Cobra, went up to her and said, what are you doing here? You know, if your father finds out about you, he'll kill you, he'll stone you, go home. But Parvana, had spent days watching her friends going to school, coming back healthier, um, families are living longer, they're, they're laughing, uh, it, their lives have completely been transformed. And Parvana realizes, even as a nine-year-old, that this is the only way her family is going to change, is if she can become educated. So Parvana keeps coming, and she comes into school day after day, and everyone sees her. And in fact, we interview the rest of the girls at a later time, and all the girls in the school know about her, and they take an oath not to say anything. So she comes back. Nobody says anything. And then the day comes, Parvana's gone, and her desk is empty. Well, the story goes like this. Earlier that day, her family had gotten a letter in the mail from a relative in Pakistan. Father couldn't read, mother can't read, nobody could read. No one had ever put, put up, took up, taken up a book. So this little girl steps up to her father and says, I can read the letter for you. And instead of killing her, which is what we thought he would do, he embraced her and he went out and told the community about it. And this is a true story. We went from 420 girls at that school to over 1,000. And the story of Pravana just went out further and further, reverberated. And then we had the next girl's school, and then the next girl's school. And I tell the story because it just shows me, see, it's not me or the military who's going to make a change in Afghanistan. It's the nine-year-old little girls like Pravana the principals like Cobra who would be killed, the fathers who take a risk because they believe so strongly that education is the hope for their future. And they see it. And they see it. And I tell you, I, and I probably have said that story you know, 500 times, and it just motivates me to the bottom of my heart because these kids are such amazing children, and uh, they are going to change the world. But you brought that back to Seattle and working with some of the elementary schools here. Tell me about that. Well, part of my philosophy, again, was we're not simply there to teach the Afghans, but they have something to teach us. And what I wanted to be able to do in, those, in the U.S. communities is to bring a taste of the developing world in Afghanistan to them. 
I'm a real believer in this global citizenship, that we need to understand what the other side of the world looks like, feels like, tastes like, and then we will um, we'll start engaging. And so I would dress kids up in turbans and burqas. I would bring in Afghan foods, uh, visitors, anything I could to give them a more realistic view of what it was like. Uh, if you walked into uh, John Hay or Co Elementary, you might find kids sitting on the floor eating rice palau from the Kabul restaurant. Uh, you might find kids dancing and uh, uh, talking with Afghan visitors. But really my hope was that they would get an idea too of what it's like to live in the developing world on a dollar a day. And um, that changes your life. You know, you don't have running water. So maybe you're not going to take a long shower today or maybe you're going to have to walk to school. But it gives them an idea of the blessings that we have here, as well as maybe to have more compassion for what it's like on that side. Your role in, in doing all of this, um, you were involved with an organization that you called INI? Yes. Okay. And really to kind of help support all of this as well. Um, now you're changing gears. And um, it's not that you don't care about all of that. But you're looking at what you've done and how else you could do things. Tell me about that and what is it that you want to accomplish now? Well, I am changing gears. So after 10 years out in Afghanistan, I have felt really called, my call was called into it, and now I'm feeling called really to leverage that work and take it to a higher level. But even while I was in Afghanistan, every time I would come back to the United States, I, I realized that we could make a big impact by talking about our stories because they were so good. I mean, if we can do this in the worst part of the world, we certainly should be able to have good results in other parts. So part of my work has been to have face-to-face -face meetings with members of Congress, the World Bank, the State Department, the White House. I want them to know how important education is, especially for educating girls. So um, I really foresee my work now is going to more of a policy level of making sure people understand the value of education and also to um, understand the solutions. So one of the groups that I've been working with is a grassroots uh, lobbying organization called Results, and they have a chapter here in Seattle. And the idea is to end the worst aspects of hunger and poverty. And I learned that there are 68 million kids in the world today, mostly girls, who are not in primary school. So having been out in the field and seen firsthand the impact that education has, I have been trying to be kind of a voice for the voiceless of bringing this message to Congress and these individuals so that they understand this is where we need to invest. Why? Why is there this, um, it almost seems this emphasis to keep girls and young women away from that opportunity to get an education, to better themselves, to then ultimately that, that would help their own families. Why is that still existing so strongly today in our world? I think some of it has to do with, well, I'll go back. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, poverty and economic disparity. Because if you only have funds to send one child to school, you're gonna send the boy. If you only have a pair of shoes for one child, you typically is given to the boy. But what we have found in study after study is that the best tool, the most radical, comprehensive way to change a community is through educating girls in particular. It impacts health, uh, economic growth, democracy, um, extremism, and we saw that all actually firsthand in Afghanistan. So just as an example, um, we used to see uh, kids having, or girls having 13 children. And today, through education, birth rates are dramatically lower. Even with boys, boys would say, you know, I'll have four wives. But through education, boys are now saying, one wife's enough, that's okay. We also have seen changes with boys as well. Uh, one of the, the stories I love to tell is the, they, the boys used to carry AK-47s into a classroom. Mm -hmm. So imagine up in the north where I am, you have all these different ethnic groups. F people had fought on different sides of the various wars. Nobody liked each other. 
they uh, killed each other, and this had gone on for decades. So now we bring them into a classroom, the guns go away, they're learning the same language, and if you came to visit, you would see them playing soccer together. So it's not simply about the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's about nation building and really building peace within Afghanistan. We haven't been very good at nation building, though. I mean, uh, not to really follow through on the commitment. And I suppose Afghanistan is a very good example of all that. Well, I would say one of the reasons for this is that our philosophy over time has been to disrupt, dis dismantle, and defeat. And we have put our emphasis into combat troops, body scans, uh, CIA <laughs> operatives, uh, cameras at airports. And the reality is we're looking way downstream from where the prob problem actually exists. It's poverty, hopelessness, lack of opportunity. So if we can focus up here and teach people new skills, uh, education, economic reform, microfinance, and bring those tools there, you don't get down here. And one of the things with our government is that we have tended to focus down here. And I remember when General Petraeus was interviewed uh, not very long ago, he actually said, we need to focus on education because we don't want to see those troops killed. We don't want to put them in harm's way. We want to get to the problem before it becomes a disaster with true extremism. What do you think of the effort now to get us out of Afghanistan? Well, it's mainly troops. Um, do you agree with that? Uh, do you think the emphasis should be then, if we're going to get out of there, then we need to really think about what our foreign aid is and how we're going to use that foreign aid to do what you've been doing? Well, one of the misbeliefs within our society is that the United States puts a lot of money into foreign aid to begin with. And in many countries, for instance, Great Britain, it's at 7%, and it's part of their philosophy. We're less than 1%. We're at 0.1%. Mm. So from my philosophy and uh, the belief of folks like results, we need to put money into these effective tools that we know will work, which are education, microfinance, global health. And you know, one of the beautiful things about Seattle is that there are a number of organizations here who are all working on those issues. But it is maintaining those types of programs in funding within Afghanistan. Now, I also believe that we do need the military there because I, th I don't believe that the Afghans are able to hold up that country and there will be problems. But can we keep going the status quo? We've already seen that that doesn't work and we need to put money into these other strategies. So I guess if you want military still there, what do you see their role in being? Trainers, empowering the folks who are there. I mean, one of the things that just occurred, I think it was yesterday or today, is the handover of many of these prisons now to the Afghans. One of the greatest things that we do as Americans is uh, ex it's exporting our constitution, our freedoms, our... Um, uh, the ability even to use these prisons as examples of what we believe in in democracy. So those are the places where I think that we can be focusing on. Uh, we'll also probably need to continue training folks that are who are over there. Our folks or their folks? Well, our troops will continue training theirs. Right. But one of the issues that I've had really since the get-go is that they've been using our troops to do a lot of reconstruction. And I feel that that reconstruction work should be put into the hands of individuals who are experts within development. So we should be there really more as advisors and uh, trainers, uh, not to get away from the sense that we're there as occupiers? Well, or in the sense that you can eliminate extremism by simply killing people, because there are millions of people around the world, and we're seeing that all over. And one of the other statistics, just to share with uh, your listeners, is that if you look at the developing world in general, about 50% of the population is under the age of 15. So when you think about this, 15-year-olds who are, will be running these countries, we will be impacted by them. So we want to give them the tools that they need in order to become educated citizens and uh, to take part in their countries, to learn about democracy, and how do you do that? Through education. What 
was the sense, what was the feedback that you got from the Afghans that you worked with about America and Americans? Where I worked, which is up in the north, it was the home of the Northern Alliance. So I was based out of Mazari Sharif. In that area in particular, people really supported America. They were very grateful for the military intervention in taking the Taliban uh, out of power. And I also, uh, my, all of my colleagues, we've been shown great respect by the people up there. Uh, there's been a real interest in America. In fact, when people know that we're putting in a school, uh, I will probably have a hundred different communities literally come to us and say, help us, help us. We're, you know, we would really love to do this. And we're also putting in computer centers now, and that's another way to link. And people are very interested in linking as well as uh, learning English. On the other hand, I can tell you that there, we might take a step forward, but there's an event that will occur that takes us 10 te steps backwards. For instance, the Quran burnings. Right. You know, people here don't understand the sensitivity and the importance of these cultural events that can occur. Uh, some of them have come out of Lewis McCord. And so part of our work here is really educating people and the troops so that they understand um, how to build these bridges of understanding and not to build the negativity. Because every time uh, those things happen, of course, it all sets this back for us. Now, are you going to stop going to Afghanistan since you're going to be concentrating so much on changing policy, changing minds on this, uh, in this area and here? Uh, you know, I honestly don't know. I can tell you, though, that the country is just etched on my heart. I, I, there hasn't been a day that I haven't been eating, breathing, and uh, praying for Afghanistan. And I just find that... Or dressing. And, or dressing yeah. Afghan. <laughs> uh, but I find that uh, right now, uh, almost 10 years' worth, my body is looking for a little bit of a change. And a little bit like a soldier, when you come back with all the traumas, uh, it's the same thing for development workers. Really? Uh, well, we live in. I guess we never think about that. We don't, but in many ways, uh, well, my life is quite different from them. You, know, you have to imagine they're surrounded by barbed wire and tanks and sandbags. Well, we live in local communities, so I rely on the graciousness of these communities uh, for survival. My friends have been shot, killed, kidnapped, beheaded, killed in plane crashes. So there's not a time that I've been over there that something hasn't happened. So I have seen this all. I have been uh, part of this. You know, I, tanks are rolling down the street. Um, and you're really on your own. And so it's, uh, it's quite a different experience. Um, it's emotional. I can hear it in your voice. It is. In fact, you know, it was interesting. The night before the World Affairs Council with um, the Jimmy Carter event, I actually had a mini breakdown. Really? <laughs> I did. And I felt uh, so unworthy of getting this medal. And I found, um, just like a soldier who probably gets a medal, and he says, why me? My friends have been killed. My friends are still there. The kids are still starving. Why me? And um, I ended up actually being drawn to uh, something that Mother Teresa wrote. And uh, she, she talks about how she got the Nobel Peace Prize, and she felt so awkward. And she said, use it as a tool for talking about the poor, for w talking about what's on your heart, for talking about these girls in Afghanistan and how they've changed my life. And so when I got up in front of the group that day to give, re receive my award, that's what I was able to focus on. And it really kept me, I guess, uh, in my, in my um, well, I, I didn't break down, but it kept <laughs> me just, I guess, solid in my truth. And the work goes on. And the work goes on. Um, but I'd love, to, I'd love to share a couple things with your readers, if you, uh, your listeners, if you don't mind, um, because I feel like there's something that they can do. And this is part of you know, Mother Teresa speaking to me. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not to be complacent, but there are things that we can do. So the first one is um, contact your representatives, your members of Congress, and ask them to put global education into the foreign aid spending bill all the debates are going on right now in Congress. Where should we put our money? What should we do? Encourage them to put it into global education, particularly 
$125 million into what's called the Global Fund, uh, the Global Partnership for Education. Excuse me. Another one is that um, our representative on the east side, Dave Reichert, was a co-sponsor with Nita Lowy of a bill pending in Congress, which is called the, um, the Education for All Act. And the purpose of this bill is to ensure that all kids have a chance to get into primary school. So uh, please contact your member of Congress, ask them to sign on to this important bill. And then the last one, contact the Obama administration. The uh, administration has not done very much with regard to global education. It's a perfect opportunity to do an initiative uh, for girls and um, encourage them to do that, encourage them to step forward and to take a leadership role. Julia Bones, thank you for your time and uh, sharing your story. Thank you so much. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you.